I do have voice, yes. Welcome. Yes. Uh, surprise. We can walk right from the ground into into the sea. So we only thought we were standing on the ground because actually the beach and the uh, the top of the ocean is above us. So maybe 10 meters above us. Uh, and if you look up, you will see a sea lion eating a fish up there. Yes, so we have here to my right ahead a kelp forest. Um, there are <clears throat> small fish of sardine, mackerel type of fish, prey fish that live there. You also see sea urchins, um, the remains of scallop shells that somebody cleaned out. Um, some starfish walking along the, the parting of the waters. It's amazing the kind of powers we have here in Second Life that we, I, can actually part the waters. Um, so you have the starfish, the uh, the horseshoe crab, and, and a couple of crabs that are, you know, crabs are just uh, adventurous little creatures, and some of them crawled out of the water and are uh, up on what used to be a table, but they'll get back in the water soon. In fact, we have another kind of crab, too. Over to my left is a, a small coral reef with some feather uh, anemone and some uh, a couple of different corals. And these corals, surprisingly, we're finding live not only in the hot water, the warm water, but in the deep cold water along the, the continental shelf. So we're just exploring some of those in the last couple of years. <clears throat> but in the warmer edges of the water, you'll see a little spider crab or a bear, an arrow crab version. You look up a little bit, you'll see a leopard shark that is um, thinking of eating small, some of the, the smaller fish. Um, So in all of the habitat builds that I do, we have both flora and fauna. We have uh, appropriate to the kind of location, and we have prey and predators. So that uh, although not everything that you will see at the Abyss Observatory in the habitats there will necessarily live right next to each other in the, the solid world. They each live in that particular kind of a habitat. So you will not see tropical mixed with uh, subarctic, for instance. We have chosen the scenes, the habitats that we have at the Abyss Observatory, because each of those is threatened, is a threatened habitat in its own way. Um, as you probably know, the entire ocean is, uh, is threatened. Oh, um, Rob, I didn't see your question for, for a minute. Yeah, the corals have been around for a very long time, um, and they have adjusted to the particular temperature and conditions of acidity in the water. Um, and as that changes, they, they don't move fast. They grow thousands of years in the same place. So they can't just pick up and swim away. So that you have um, the acidic water that has absorbed the carbon dioxide from the air is a, a real threat. Uh, in a sense, you know, it's, it's burning the corals, it's bleaching them out. Um, but so far, the deep water corals that are cold water corals that we didn't even know about 15 years ago, 
are are doing okay. So uh, at the Abyss Observatory, we have highlighted all of these different kinds. We have a tropical area with the, the tropical corals, but we also have the the deep water, uh, cold water corals. Uh, and as more research is done, as more research comes to light, we keep um, updating the the notes and the commentary and the uh, the tours that we do. So the same thing that is affecting the corals, though the the change in temperature and the change in acidity is also affecting the the kelp forest. And those aren't actually trees. They're not actually forest in that sense. They're um, algae, um, and so. In the habitats uh, at the abyss, we have a number of different kinds. Here we only have three kinds, but um, it gives you a sense of what that is. And these are very much the the nursery areas, so that you have uh, the spawning areas. You also have the the fishing areas. The sharks will come in and out of there. The bluefish will come in and out of here. Um, I didn't get to put bluefish out, but I will shortly. Um, but this is just kind of to give you a little taste of the, the vast extent of the uh, threatened habitats that we have over at the Abyss Observatory. Um, the sign in the back behind me on the back wall does have a landmark, and we certainly encourage you to come visit. Um, there are coastal as well as undersea habitats there. Um, so the coastal includes two sets of rainforests. You have the um, the northern temperate rainforest and its complete kind of habitat, and you also have the uh, the southern rainforest. Not the kind that you find in the Amazon, but uh, the southern temperate, so that you have, this is uh, the coast of Tasmania and um, southern Australia. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they they have detected Shiloh. They have detected radiation in some of the um, the animals that they have captured and tested, but they don't know what the long term effect will be. They don't know if it's going to have a genetic um, changes generation after generation. So they're still testing this out. You know, it's only, it's not that long ago. And so you have some of the sea animals that will have generation, multiple generations, but not all of them in that time. Um, one of the, um, yeah, they're still checking around Chernobyl and light, wildlife has come back around Cheno Chernobyl. So you have, um, deer, you have wolves, you have, and are those being negatively affected? We don't yet know that either. Um, so, it's, it's an exciting area to, to investigate because so many changes are happening. Now, one of the things that you don't see in the water, actually there are two things that I talked about on our tour the other day, uh, last week, and one is that everywhere, in all of the oceans now, they are finding microplastics. And whether those are in the water or whether they are in the animals, that they are everywhere, even in the Arctic. So. Although the water looks clean and pristine, you know, it does have the microplastics. And I don't know that that will ever get cleaned out in our 
in our species lifetime. I mean, this is long-term um, damage that has been done in that sense. The other thing that I talked about, and this is something that people don't typically think about, we think about the importance of the forests in the oxygen cycle, but what people don't normally think about or even know is the cycle of oxygen that is uh, generated in the ocean, so that in the Arctic, for instance, uh, and particularly because you have the, the great differential in temperature, um, you have the um, plankton that rises and sinks, and it is that rising and sinking of uh, billions and billions and billions of plankton over every day that churns the water in the Arctic and uh, churns nutrients up to the surface and uh, oxygen up to the surface. So, questions? I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I'd be glad to do more tours over at the Abyss. And uh, if you just want to hang up, hang out up here, there's a uh, sitting seashell on the, the beach in the rock up top. You can just hang out and read. Well, I'll be glad to ask, answer any questions. Well, <laughs> I did the display in layers because that's the way it is in the ocean. Um, you have the the shore layer and you have the uh, many layers underneath so that um, words are important but there's nothing like an experience and that's one of the beauties of Second Life uh, to me anyway that you can uh, talk about things but if I go and I step into the kelp it has an entirely different feel than standing out and looking at it or talking about it. I see the fish swimming around above me. I, I can feel the, the rough sand below. So it's an entirely different experience. Um, in, oh, I did, I was, yes, you're right, I did have a, this was years ago, the Glacier Bill, that was when we had the Center for Water Studies, and we did have a, a Glacier Build, and every once in a while we did tours where we would melt the glacier and uh, raise the sea level, yeah, yeah, that was, a, oh, God, that's got to be at least 10 years ago. Um, yeah, so we, at the Abyss um, Observatory, we do have the, the deep layers. Of course, we can't do the thousand meters, so it's a, um, an as if. Um, but you have the, um, the hot water um, Yeah, you do have the uh, the deep water there, and it, it's probably down about a hundred um, meters in in our exhibit, but it would be down thousands of meters. Uh, so you have the hydrothermal vents down there, <coughs> and the the uh, tube worms and all that would be along the the vents. Um, this is uh, Baragon. Uh, Dilly, do you mind if I interrupt? No, go ahead. Um, I think we have about 12 minutes per booth, so if you don't mind, um, I think we should... Uh, um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, move along to our next booth if uh, everyone's ready. Yes, absolutely. Go along, come visit me at the Abyss Observatory, and hang out back here anytime.
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if everyone has uh, the note card, but um, our next booth will be um, Mike Shaw. So um, let's all follow Mike over to his booth. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. And now I have to figure out where my booth is. Alright, so um, I haven't done a mic um, check, so I'm hoping that people can hear me. Uh, let's see. La 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 la, I'm all confused. How scary. Alright, it's like. Unless I'm I feel like the blind leading the digital. Alright, so yeah, I've got Zoom going and uh, all sorts of things happening. Oh, here we are. Okay. Duh. Duh. Alright, so, um,. <clears throat> I kept my booth fairly simple um, because I've got a whole region over um, or a whole uh, part of this sim over in the uh, northeast. Uh, so um, I also prepared uh, some um, uh, text uh, that I can feed into text chat. So um, basically I thought I'd go with uh, start, start organize, organize my talk with uh, some of the questions that Chantal and uh, Jess posed. Uh, today and the first one was what have you done in the last year? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that uh, So um, For uh, those of you who don't know me. Here's a little bit more about me uh, professionally. It's basically my orchid um, ID uh, uh, Page publications grants and stuff like that um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing uh, for science circle in addition uh, to um, some, some of the science uh, so um, always support, uh, or I always like to acknowledge NSF for uh, supporting what we do. Basically, uh, the current grant, which ends on Sunday night, um, is, is is that one. There is a new grant. Um, uh, so you know, in the last year, I've been on the Science Foundation um, board. I hope I've been an asset. Uh, tried to help with management issues and fundraising. I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, general brainstorming and hopefully moral support or not or at least not actively immoral support uh, So what have I done in the last year? I've given some talks made some model maintain an exhibit on the northeast uh, corner of the sim So there's giant models of molecules. One of the things I love about Second Life is that I can take um, single crystal x-ray diffraction data from the public databases um, feed it through uh, visualization uh, software on my uh, PC, then feed it through Blender, then upload it into Second Life. So I'm actually wearing some very stylish molecules, um, ones from uh, my research. Uh, I'll tell you about those in a uh, second. So um, being able to import actual um, molecular structures Right. These look like ball and stick models, but the distances between the atoms are faithful to what is found in nature. These are the measured distances and angles. So these are like snapshots, 3D snapshots. So I've been able to use these to uh, help students uh, visualize more the uh, 3D aspects of the um, um, of, of chemistry. Um, and of course, uh, you'll notice I am uh, still drinking coffee. That's that's how I teach in, in my classroom as well. One of the other things I've done is uh, sh shown um, atomic and molecular orbitals and um, understanding the shape of where electrons can wander in atoms and molecules uh, builds an intuitive understanding of what chemistry is possible. So, um, you know, my uh, recordings have been used in my classes. Um, the, um, um, the Silicon Life recording, uh, they really liked that for his classroom. My bioinorganic students loved it. So, um, you know, the recordings we've done for Second Life 
um, in uh, science circles and uh, have found their way into uh, my teaching. So, um, so I, I show a couple of models here, uh, basically on the table. So the one in the middle um, has an animation um, associated with it. So if I click on it, it'll start. And basically, those are d-orbitals. Um, they're the regions where electrons can wander on particular elements like uh, iron, for example. And there's a little cube. And the little cube has six atoms, one embedded in the middle of um, every face. And the cube basically shows how these um, orbitals break into two groups. There's one group where the lobes point directly at the atoms, and there's another group where uh, the lobes point in between the atoms. So you basically get the um, 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 uh, pattern of uh, two orbitals above, uh, three that remain below. Well, uh, this is this splitting in um, energy is the basis of why so many metal compounds have such gorgeous colors. And it's basically the basis of what's called crystal field theory, which is uh, you know used by geologists to explain the color of rubies, emeralds, sapphires, um, azurite, uh, all the beautiful uh, copper, chromium, iron um, compounds that uh, exist in nature. So I'm going to stop that. Yeah, yay, it stops eventually. No. Click. Okay, I didn't click on it right. So um, the more see-through um, models on the table are um, showing how um, uh, atoms interact with each other to, to, to make t turn their atomic orbitals, like where electrons can go if they're just associated with a single atom, into molecular orbitals, and how those molecular orbitals can interact uh, with, um, you know, from from an atom to like an organic molecule. So, let's see. Uh, want to talk a little bit about grant proposals. This year uh, we submitted two grant proposals uh, they, that weren't funded, uh, one to Sloan uh, Foundation and one to uh, NSF um, for uh, science education outreach through virtual worlds. Um, hmm, my, um, my, my reser giver is not um, working for you guys. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. I've got a uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that eventually. You can um, come back and have them. So um, the latter, the um, second NSF grant was a team from my institution and from Science Circle. This was a wonderful experience, and um, it's uh, the resubmit would be due in November. So we're starting to look at uh, redoing that one. Um, let's see. We've got. Starting Monday, my uh, newest grant with um, George Ritheratu, University of Oklahoma. He's, he's been my friend for many, many years, and we've been collaborating oh, almost 20 years now. Um, Boomer and, Sooner. Uh, yay. Yeah, he is, yeah. I actually visit OU uh, once or twice a year <laughs> to hang out with the group. Um, so, yeah, George was chair of the University of Oklahoma's chemistry department for about a year. Oh, I wonder if he, you know, my dad was a, uh, a chemist at uh, University of Oklahoma, but I think well before uh, his time. Probably. He started there in about 1993. So, yeah. uh, probably might be, unless your dad's, unless you're much younger than I think you are. Um, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yeah, so... So yeah, so basically we've got a little bit of money from um, from there. There's the uh, new award. Um, so as I said, fourth award in a row. So uh, that's what I'm. Um, that's actually uh, some of the results from the third award are what I'm wearing right now. Um, so um, a little bit of science uh, for you. What I'm wearing, heme. Uh, it's a big planar organic molecule which uh, has an iron atom in the center. Um, the effect, when you look at it, it looks like Saturn, right? So the rings are the organic part. The metal is the uh, big uh, planet in the middle. The heme is found in hemoglobin. It's what oxygen binds to for transport from your lungs to tissues. Um, and I've got, let's see, on my right-hand shoulder, that is 
um, an actual heme. On my left hand shoulder, it's not a heme, it's an octaethyl porphyrin. It, it looks very similar. Um, chemists just kind of change uh, minor parts of structures and give them uh, totally different names. Um, the, uh, the compound on my left shoulder has six um, things attached to the central metal atom. That's that um, red atom right in the middle. The one on my right shoulder has five things attached, and that ended up being kind of important. Um, so heme's found in many proteins. There's some examples. I learned all about these when I taught my bioinorganic class this spring. I have no training in um, biochemistry, so teaching a class on biochemistry was delightful. I learned a lot. Um, so um, I, other things I've been doing in the last year, learning how to use Google Cardboard a little more, uh, a little better. We take um, some of these structures, plop them into Unity. Um, I got a classroom set of 30 Google Cardboard um, devices that uh, we can take my students uh, in through tours of giant molecules. Um, the uh, and uh, that's a Google exposition or ex expedition uh, link that uh, should work in Chrome if you want to look at it uh, uh, yourself at some other point. Um, and well, thanks. On that, so. Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Mike. I, I didn't mean to step on you there. I am just getting a little anxious about the time because I do think uh, I think we have a limited amount of time to fit this first group of booths in. So, sure. Do you mind if we maybe move along? Yes, I'm uh, perfectly happy doing that. All right. Okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Very I'm much. Available for questions. Very good. Uh, thank you for uh, that. Was very good. Thank you. And um, so uh, our next booth will be uh, Vic Malachek, uh, uh, Dr. Phil Youngblood. So uh, why don't we all uh, follow him over to his booth? Actually, if you just kind of turn around uh, and go over to the other side of this walkway, you'll see the booth. Uh, talking to the sheep. Yeah, I like to talk to sheep too. They even talk back. <laughs> I talk to my dogs. Okay, uh, since there is some time, uh, for me, uh, my presentation here is somewhat um, extended. Um, bordering on impromptu. I kind of threw everything together in the last few years uh, because this last year has been a blur. And I just got a brand new computer. I wouldn't even get into Second Life, so I got a brand new computer and it's doing just fine. Thank you. Um, I, it's interesting going through the inventory after about 11 years. So I threw some things together and let me start to show you a couple things that's going on. Uh, I had the privilege of being in Science Life um, and in Science Circle from the very beginning. I gave the first presentation, actually, for the Science back in March of 2008. Uh, if you'd like, there's a copy of the, the channel of the slides for the first presentation on the to the far left. Um, if you've been in Science Circle for long enough, you'll know that we've been doing many, many places. Uh, before we had this island here, we were by a number of places. Um, and same thing for my university, we've had three islands. Uh, they're all coming down. In fact, one of them should have already. They're probably going to charge for a month or whatever. Uh, and I've had... Um, relationships with other universities. For example, over here, the prominent uh, piece, or the prominent article here is this airport. And what it represents is back in 2009, I think it is, I had a class with uh, students in Mexico and France and a professor in France and we kind of taught a programming class in Java. And we had the students uh, present or converse with 
with each other um, in English and in French, and they built things like this airplane. If you want, there's a do-it-yourself airplane kit. Now, I will warn you that and one of the things I don't see a lot in Second Life these days is actual physics. Um, in other words, making objects which, instead of static, they uh, sit there. In other words, most objects just sit here, but if you actually make objects that have physical properties, they'll drop and bang into it. I'm going to try more of those um, in the near future. But this airplane actually flies, etc. You can make your own with the do-it-yourself airplane kit. Now, you have to be, one of the things is it helps for people to work together. Uh, it helps. Uh, you have to be precise in how you put things together. Otherwise, the airplane is going to fly like an airplane that isn't put together and crash. Um, there's some other objects here of, uh, that you may find of interest. Um, over on this other side are a few of the presentations I've done in for the Science Circle, including the Let's see, my avatar is kind of um, being squirrely right now. Maybe. Okay, up on the very top, you want to get a copy of the presentation done for the 10th, uh, 10th anniversary um, that was in 2018. The, um, let's see, my like I said, my avatar is kind of squirrely. I don't know, I can't. Uh, walk over there so you have to uh, get within hearing distances. Um, the fall here is to teach a class. In other words, I just retired. I've been working for 45 years, time. been teaching for 21 at university, and I figure it's time to do something else. And so I'm going to get back to where I have a lot more time in life and science circle and stuff. And I'm going to teach a full class in the fall. And what I thought I'd do is to uh, go around to all the different places in Second Life and to see what the students wanted to see and to explain all of what's going on in kind of science in Second Life. In other words, kind of a student-led or student-driven um, type of class. And then I might get down to something a little more um, formal. I always like this type of atmosphere where it's not formal. In other words, people get together, you never know. People from all over the world, they're all interested. And so I'm very much looking forward to that. And I'll tell you a bit uh, uh, later in the summer about, more about what it's like. I've been talking to um, Chantel and Jess about arranging. Um, the type of presentations I've done in the past... Uh, just like the very first one had to do with a global climate change. We are experiencing that right now. Uh, Paris was 113 degrees Fahrenheit the other day, the highest it's ever been recorded. Um, we will find, of course, that climate change is continuing to uh, be a big issue. And I'm going to um, so that's been one of my bigger presentations. Um, I also uh, uh, minor in astronomy, so I've been doing those and computer technology. Um, I'll probably have uh, future time periods where I ha present uh, computer uh, science and allow people to like put together uh, networks in second life and communications work and stuff like that. I don't see a lot of those. I see a lot of some of the other types of presentations. Um, let's see, I don't know how much more my 10 minutes uh, is, but luckily we have these this for some time. And so um, I think I will wrap mine up now and so we can uh, allow us to see some of the other booths. Any questions? Very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Vic. I appreciate that. So who do you have next? Okay, so uh, uh, thank you. I was just taking care of a little housekeeping here. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Sira Gia, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Larson, if he is uh, Lawson, rather. Uh, La 
Robert Lawson Brown, I should say, um, should, uh, um, is he ready? Uh, Robert, uh, yes. will, you be, will you be speaking in voice? Okay, very good. All right. Uh, so let's uh, follow uh, Robert, to, or rather, uh, uh, Siri Gaya to his booth. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, my name is uh, Robert Lawson Brown, and I prefer the pronunciation in Second Life of Sairi Gira, uh, Sairi Gia, uh, Gia being the name given to uh, the entire system of the world, and uh, Sairi is related to seeking for knowledge. Um, basically, I am a retired physicist. I got my doctorate back in 1978. And uh, for my career, I've been working in industry, in the deep, dark recesses of industry, in particular in the uh, areas of... Uh... However, uh, I also uh, uh, have been engaged in photography and a little videography. I thought that now that I'm retired, I might try to produce some educational materials. One of my first efforts has been in the area of photography. I had noticed uh, online that uh, a number of uh, people that uh, would be producing uh, instructional videos for often did not seem to have a understanding of uh, the optics and the physical process. Let me bring my chat back up. Yeah, I'm afraid there may be some network lag problems. Uh, in fact, uh, earlier uh, during one of the uh, talkers here, uh, the network gods uh, kicked me out and I had to come back, but uh, we'll press forward. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I thought that uh, instructional videos, uh, things as basic optics and basic color theory, would be useful for people that new photography, especially with boom that has resulted from the availability of digital cameras. <clears throat> so, I've done two lectures for the science circle so far. Uh, one was on the uh, optics for photography which I introduced ray tracing and uh, some of the basic uh, lens configurations. Talked about perspective and uh, relationship to focal length at the focus. Uh, another one was on color where I kind of stumbled through an explanation of the chromaticity diagram uh, and uh, I actually have a little short tutorial that you can uh, download if you want uh, in my note card. There's a note card vendor just behind me here. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see what I come up with in the future for uh, additional talks along the same line. Not sure what else to say at this point. Um, you know, it's quite a milestone getting into retirement as I have. Uh, my age in years now exceeds my height in inches. Something that all of us will face. Well, maybe not the Europeans, because you use centimeters for your height, so you have a big, very big advantage there. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm 66 inches high and 68 and 68 years old. Uh, so that that's where that uh, uh, merge happens. Um, so, uh, maybe some questions? As I mentioned, I do have a, uh, a short little tutorial you can download, and maybe I'll get one up for uh, basic optics as well, uh, and uh, uh, we'll see how that goes. Did have a uh, 
lawyer from my formal industry association to do a tutorial one day. That's the kind of thing I'm looking at doing. Hey, um, all right. I guess that's uh, about very it. good. This is a, this is Baragon again. Um, uh, maybe so. In the interest of time, uh, which is uh, I'm kind of obsessed with this morning, um, why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, advance along to our next booth? Then our next booth presenter is uh, Stephen Gazer, who uh, we know here is to Stephen Zodify, very familiar to our uh, Science Circle uh, students. And uh, uh, Stephen, let's uh, let's uh, follow you to your booth. All right, thanks. I'm glad everyone could be here. It's right behind me at the corner. Head this way. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Siri. That was a very nice presentation. Nice and short. <laughs> yes, I can promise I'll probably be not as short. As everyone clusters around, I'll get started. Uh, one thing you can do is click on this box where you can grab a note card, a landmark, a little bit of history about myself. So just in terms of what I've been doing in Second Life, uh, my background is really informed by the fact that I have a molecular biology PhD that I was very interested in doing research. Uh, but when that career path as a research academic didn't work out, I went into straight teaching, and I started at the University of New Orleans. Although I've always been a bit of a technophile growing up, so I found Second Life as kind of a fun thing to do when it was offered by a grant that had been awarded for developing classes at the university. And the class I decided to teach was non-science majors biology something that was trying to give, again, non-science majors a survey of what science is about, the thinking, some of the basic ideas. Uh, not necessarily extremely in-depth, but I like to get students to try and think about their world and the background of chemistry and biology and how it is important today. Uh, but then also to try and leverage Second Life to be interactive. Uh, so I taught that class three or four times, and different years I did different things. Uh, one thing I'll direct your attention to here, well, again, if you look, sorry, if you look above my booth, you'll see like Mike Shaw had some fully res 3D versions of molecules that are faithful to the uh, bond length and orientation of the chemistry, the balls and sticks. There are the bonds and the atoms. Uh, these were made with Hyros Reser, who um, developed it some some time ago, early in the days. But I mean, just show. I mean, I would use these as props during class. But what I really wanted students to do was to interact and try and think about how chemistry works. And so I developed this uh, couple of tools. Take a look at this one here. This is just a shell model of molecules. And what I would do is the little yellow dots are electrons. And so I really challenged students to understand the bonding and challenge properties of getting electrons to go together. and this molecule is an example of why nitrogen has three hydrogens that stick to it as compared to, say, four for carbon. And I really asked them to build these types of things uh, by giving them resors and the basic molecules. Uh, similar, again, not worrying so much about orientation and bond length and all that, made similar types of objects that were worth the ball and stick model that, again, asked the students to put them together, really try and construct them, and you know, be interactive with the world. Uh, the other one, the um, I don't know how many of you, how many, can I get a, like a show of yeses or a show of hands of how many people did any sort of breedable type of things in Second Life for a while? Anybody remember the breedable bunnies? Those, again, those didn't have true genetics, as you would think about for Mendelian genetics, but as a way to challenge the students to think about it, is I asked them to actually breed a pair of bunnies. Uh, during the course of the semester, they have to go back and check on them and feed them and make sure that they're doing okay. And they can pick them up and pet them. And then I asked them to make pedigrees. Now, I pre-made all of the 
uh, diagrams, the charts, and everything as you see them on these pedigrees. But then I challenged the students, well, what sort of genetic inheritance pattern would explain this? And in fact, non-Mendelian could just be an answer to try and accommodate that. Again, I actually had a student who got incredibly upset and cried because she, the, the food thing didn't link to her bunny and it basically died. And uh, I got it to revive. So it was kind of interesting seeing students really kind of get involved and interact. Uh, again, there are lots of other things I've done. I had I, I don't have really space here to display some of the other things, but I had them do posters, and they could get animal avatars, which I would help them buy from Grendel's for like five or ten linden, and then a lot of them present on the animals and really enjoyed that. So again, my feeling about teaching was really to be take advantage of Second Life, make it interactive for them. Uh, as someone just mentioned, we yeah we did do lots of tours of Genome Island. There were great interactive displays there, and um, that was a great place. In fact, these two cells that you see here are variants of Max's big cell. This one here displaying the mitochondria, where I talk about energy conversion rates, where you have mitochondria versus this cell over here, where, again, you get less energy, we don't have the mitochondria. And so, yeah, I have lots. I have, I have a huge ton of rabbits, because I took them all back from the students um, in my inventory somewhere. They are all past dead. Um, okay, so, and at one point I left University of New Orleans and went to go teach at Ball State. And there I really didn't teach basic biology, I actually taught an honors course. And that's where I was also delving more into Open Simulator. I actually had a full tour interactive activity. And around this time, also finished off a build on population genetics, which is actually hosted over there in the corner. There's a landmark, there's a note card giver, and if anybody wants to, over the coffee break, I can give them a little bit of a tour of how that works. So I'm not teaching anymore. I love teaching, and I'm currently doing genome engineering uh, enabling technology. Again, trying to make genetic engineering work better, work faster, more efficiently in corn as a part of Corteva AgriSciences, based here in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, again, this is getting back to my molecular biology uh, research roots. But I'm still very interested in philosophy, history of science, so I've been continu oh, excuse me, continuing to present for Science Circle. Uh, you know, the, there's a, the back of my booth, I have the opening slide for, well, I wish I could create super bunnies, that'd be pretty cool, but no, nah, just, just letting them let them be happy little bunnies and do things that bunnies do. Uh, that display the titles of some of the majority of my talks or panels. And you'll see that I do have a little bit more of a philosophy of science uh, bent, as well as how it influences current culture. I um, still find it interesting and continuing to keep my lecture series going. Uh, in that note card, and also on the Science Circle website, there is my the majority of my videography of the talks that I've done. And so if you want to go back and view those on YouTube anytime, and I will be continuing to have some more topics. So if that's, that's, uh, anybody yeah. has any questions, that, that's kind that, of that's where I've been and enjoyed it. Uh, a very nice booth. Um, and I did want to uh, point out, actually, a number of the booths have note card givers. So, uh, 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 so feel free to, as you wander along here, um, pick up uh, note cards about each topic. Um, so, uh, if you don't mind trying to keep with our schedule again, I think we have one more presenter before our uh, 8 o'clock break. Um, and we're going to switch switch up the order a little bit and uh, let uh, Fostic um, uh, uh, give us his presentation so um, everybody try to <laughs> find Fosnick and let's follow him to his booth. Uh, where is he? I don't see him. Oh, I saw him here earlier. Uh, hey, 
Yeah, I'm on voice. Can people hear me? Yes, I hear you. Good. If there's any trouble with the voice, please let me know. Oh, the voice is breaking up? Hmm. I wonder what I can do about that. Lots of people seem to be having that problem. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not the greatest with the, uh, with the voice, so, um, if it gets out of hand, let me know. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'll just go with it. Alright, so I guess I will start. Um, so, um, let's see. Looking at the time. So I'll just keep this to, um, five or, or maybe, I don't know, seven minutes, and if people have questions, um, I'm happy to take questions. In fact, I don't know, this is a very short presentation, so I think people should feel free to jump in on voice anytime, immediately, um, as I'm going along, um, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to listen and just make it a, a short conversation. Um, in any event, so, uh, yeah, so feel, feel free to jump in. You know, um, I, I worked hard on my images and the content, but I'm not, I'm not a real builder, so, uh, for three-dimensional stuff, I guess I have to leave it to others, but, but thank you. Um, so, um, so basically I have a graduate background in microbiology where I studied, um, bacteria, oh thanks, thanks for the compliments, where I study bacteria that metabolize really strange things. They, they, they live in strange environments and metabolize uh, heavy metals and weird things like that. It, it just got me generally interested in, in uh, sort of strange uh, or extremophile microbes. Yep, extremophiles. And, and that led me to an interest in um, search for microbial life, like bacteria, beyond Earth. Um, so that then led me eventually to, uh, more relatively more recently, since I'm getting old, to uh, an interest in essentially subsurface uh, oceans or subsurface bodies of water. So I think it's really intriguing that in, in relatively recent years it has become clear that in moons in the solar system, not, not the moon, but in moons of Jupiter <coughs> and Mars, for example, there are um, moons I mean, the moons of those planets have uh, subsurface oceans, ocean, bodies of water essentially under, usually under ice, or actually always under ice that we know of. Uh, let me read as we're going along. They've discovered microbes that can digest plastic. Right. There are microbes that can live in weird environments and, and metabolize, metabolize or digest all sorts of things. And that makes the prospects for microbes that can live beyond Earth in unusual conditions relative to Earth uh, more possible seemingly possible. So right, so on other on other moons like Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, and I have the side displays on that, there are these bodies of liquid water, and I just find this intriguing right off the bat, that there are these enormous bodies of not just ice, but liquid water uh, trapped under the ice surface of the moons. And the, the water exists basically because the layer on top gives pressure to keep water liquid, and there's heat provided essentially from the pull of the gravity of the host planet. Let's see, if I remember correctly, Europa has more liquid water than Earth. I don't know if that's true, but uh, I think it's got a ton of liquid water, you know, uh, subsurface ocean, and I, I would bet it would be, I don't know, actually, but it's a lot. So it's just fascinating. So what's in that water? I mean, water is the fundamental medium of life, and it seems to be the, the thing that most likely uh, be most important for uh, life to develop potentially uh, outside of Earth, um, and that that's what that's what's so intriguing to me fundamentally. On these other moons in the solar system, have the, the basic chemistry that you, you you might think could lead to life, um, and in particular, as the display on my left shows, there are believed to be and some of these moons, particularly Europa. Uh, features underneath the surface with a lot of minerals and chemistry and even sort of mixing with geysers um, and so and so there you have real possibilities for, for life in terms of chemistry water uh, and the mixing um, right as far as there might be microbial life on Mars too you know the research that I've done on Mars suggests that there is almost I mean I don't know I could be wrong but it seems to me that there is almost certainly not microbial life on Mars present day because it's just so dry. There's there's essentially no liquid water. There might be some transient liquid water for a little while and then it disappears. I think even under the surface of present day Mars, there's essentially no water. 
don't get me wrong, there's tons of ice, but life needs liquid water, at least life that we know it. So who knows? But I also think that if, if you notice one of my slides the, on the top, I think it's the third one from my, let's see, it would be my left, there's a slide on Mars that, that like way, way back, um, millions of years ago, Mars could have had liquid water, it could have had flowing water, it might have had life, we just wouldn't know today. So who knows? Uh, and right, there are features on Mars that suggest potential canals that might have had liquid water in the past. I think that's entirely possible, and it's just fascinating. Just reading from Vic, two sources say from two to four times the water on Europa as on Earth. So that's just intriguing, isn't it? I mean, imagine the oceans of Earth, right? And imagine an underwater ocean larger than that of on Earth, on a foreign planet, on a moon of another planet. It, it's almost hard for me to believe that there aren't microbes in that. I mean, where there's water, there seems to be the potential for life. And I mean, indeed, water is, is what makes the chemistry of life basically possible. Um, so yeah, uh, in, on Europa, I, re, I remember that the, the belief, strong belief now, is that, the, that there is um, oodles of liquid water, but it's way beneath, beneath miles of ice. So to get down there, I mean, uh, it would be hard to... Uh, Let's see, so we're going to need to step up our production if we want to get the same, let's see what this says, the same concentration of micro, oh yeah, that, that part I don't know when it comes to microplastics and all, that's, that's beyond my, my knowledge, yeah. but um, anyway, so I'll just go on for, maybe I'll, I'll stop in a minute because this is a short presentation, so let me just look at some questions. Let's see, last year they discovered signs of underwater lakes near Mars South Pole, so I'd have to read that. I, I would think that it'd be next to impossible that there would currently Water, liquid water lakes on present day Mars, but if there is, I would be intrigued. Um, in, in any event, there's definitely uh, underwater liquid water throughout the solar system. And one thing that they can do is the satellites can pick up like detritus from like uh, from geysers and such that might spew chemicals into the air, and that can give chemical signatures of life, um, can, can lead to further exploration. I'll read just a couple more questions, maybe, and I'm, I'm happy to cut it off. I know time is, is a bit tight. Let's see. I worry um, about the bottom of the ocean. Uh, yeah, go James, ahead. Have you, uh, have you seen the recent reports about high meth methane levels on Mars? Um, I don't know too much about it, but I saw a headline about that. Yeah, you know, I did, and it's intriguing, and I haven't had the chance to read more about it. I think I'll do so today. When you see reports of high levels of things like methane, um, it, it definitely... Um, uh, it, there are natural causes that are not, you know, too exciting, but there could be organic, you know, life-based causes that are very exciting. In fact, on one of the images that I have up, I think it's the one on Titan. Um, yeah, the one on the one on Titan on the bottom. I guess it's my bottom left. So they uh, there's evidence of um, potentially like uh, surface liquid. Uh, I think it's methane and ethane and so forth. Where you, where you get that kind of thing, you get the possibility of methanogenic or different types of bacteria. Uh, so yeah, that's intriguing. I need to read about it. I, ho I really hope that I'm just dead wrong about Mars. Anyway, um, so right, so it's been about eight minutes. I'm happy to take any other questions or I'm happy to, to cut it off. Well, thanks very much, James. That's a really nice booth and I, it's a great topic. Hey, th uh, thanks a lot. I think that's Baragon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for listening. And if anyone wants to contact me about anything, feel free. Thanks, Sizuchi. Thanks, Delia. Thanks, Vic. Have a good weekend. All right. Well, we're at, Thanks, we're at the uh, 8 o'clock hour. I think uh, we're scheduled to have a little break here. I think um, Chantal has planned uh, some musical entertainment. So uh, feel free to wander around and explore the booths more also. Uh, we will reconvene at uh, 9 a.m. Second Life time um, for our second uh, panel of booth presenters. So stick around. Um, so uh, looks like we're just at 9 o'clock. Um, Fumon. Uh, are you uh, ready to uh, uh, start us off uh, with the, your booth? Um, if not, we can uh, move along. Um, 
Uh, I should also mention um, that uh, we do have a, a booth from Deep Thinker O, um, who is not present today, but I did want to uh, point out that uh, we do have a booth. So feel free to uh, visit the booth, even though we don't have a presenter for it today. And uh, maybe just also some housekeeping. I did want to remind everyone that um, the Science Circle here in Second Life is a grant-funded nonprofit organization. Um, that uh, sort of with the goal of uh, developing uh, virtual world platforms for science education um, and uh, sort of uh, concomitant with that mission um, the science circle does uh, by necessity have to enforce you know certain um, uh, conventions of uh, good behavior and um, and uh, good dress and so forth uh, you know modesty <laughs> modesty and friendliness um, so um, so I just wanted to uh, uh, I guess uh, explain that uh, on this our final um, sort of uh, uh, science circle event before the summer break Uh, so I'm not quite sure if Fumon is ready to go with her booth. Um, she will be, um, uh, presenting in text in the nearby chat. Oh, looks like she's heading over to her booth. And, um, uh, I will, uh, read her, uh, uh, her text in voice uh, for purposes of uh, recording. Fumon and I look kind of hilarious close together because of our height differences. Um, so, uh, Fumon welcomes everyone. Hello, Science Circle. This is the Fukushima booth, as we know very well. Welcome. In this April, WTO, World Trade Organization, judged that Korea can forbid to import fish of Fukushima and seven, Jap seven Japan prefectures. Of course, almost all Fukushima fish are almost safe and free about radiation. But nowadays, too many Japanese persons have the very narrow uh, and small and childish nationalism as like as Mr. Donald Trump. I'm very sad for this. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe did not meet President Moon Jae-in Korea at G20 Osaka summit personally. This was the very bad attitude. I have many Korean friends, and I can use Korean language a bit. Hello. Um, 
I want to say this to all uh, Science Circle friends. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you'll be waiting a long time. I should say that uh, Fumon has done a fantastic job of documenting the recovery of uh, the Fukushima reactor um, here in Second Life. Well, <laughs> I think Fumon uh, um, uh, popped over to the Fukushima exhibit maybe to pick up a landmark. Um, should we uh, move along to the next booth? I'm not quite sure if... Um, oh, uh, she, um, she poofed on, uh, on my screen. Um, uh, should we move along to the next booth then? Okay. If you do want to uh, learn more about the Fukushima reactor, I really recommend uh, going to um, her um, uh, her main exhibit. So, um, uh, so uh, the next on uh, my list is uh, Dodge Three Beards, uh, Greg Perrier. Um, Dodge, are you uh, prepared to? Uh, um, uh, present your booth to us. All right, great. Lead the way. See Dodge, where is the booth? Uh, yes, I hear uh, I hear your voice. Oh good, Fumon is back. Oh, thank you, Fumon. All right. Uh, Fumon, do you have a uh, more a uh, presentation to continue with, or are you uh, ready for us to move along? Okay, very good. It looks like she's continuing.
So Fuman asks, how do you think about G20? Well, I would like to say that uh, um, the G20 is one of the many multilateral institutions that were created after the horrors of World War II to suppress nationalism, the nationalism that gave rise to World War I and World War II. And um, I'm in favor of those kinds of institutions, and I think they should endure. Well, um, I think uh, I need to be a little bit disciplined on time here. Uh, Fumon, do you mind if we uh, move along to, uh, to Dodge's uh, booth now? I think we've uh, timed this out to about 12 minutes per booth, and we're at just about 9, uh, 9.15. So thank you very much, Fumon, uh, a, a wonderful booth. And let's uh, move along to uh, Dodge's booth now, across the bridge. Yeah, there we go. Now the voice is working. I'm going to mute my microphone while you talk. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, well, I'll just talk in, in voice then. If somebody has an issue, uh, let me know. Um, I will do some texting then. Um, I'm Greg Perrier. I, uh, manage a, a college campus uh, in uh, Second Life. It's the Northern Virginia Community College. Um, I've been doing this for about, well, since 2012, so getting up on seven years now. So what you're seeing here are some of the things that we have at the campus. Um, you're always welcome to visit it. We call, even though it's called the Northern Virginia Community College, we call it NOVA. And so you'll see at the top there, there's a, you can click on that and teleport to Nova's campus if you want to any time uh, after this and uh, visit it. You're welcome to come and look around. Um, so basically we, we deal with uh, biology there. I'm, I'm a biologist and so I had a preference for that. And we have put in a bunch of about 22 different uh, activities for students. We get about 400 students over an academic year doing stuff. And so you're just seeing some of the things here that we have put out for students. For example, on the back of the booth, you see a, a poster. Uh, we, one of our professors has her students doing um, poster sessions, and they do this in Second Life. And so all the students make a poster. Uh, we import that into Second Life. We put it up, and so we have a big poster session. So that's an example of a student's poster, one of the better ones. Um, 
and they get experience at actually making a poster, which they might do later in life at a conference or something like that. Uh, we have a place where the students um, collect different balls of different sizes. You're seeing this here. This is a glucose molecule. The black balls are carbon. The green balls are oxygen, and the pink balls are hydrogen. The student gets one of each. They make copies as needed, and they move them around and put it together, and they actually make a glucose molecule. So the student can look at a glucose molecule in a textbook or a picture of a glucose molecule, but actually building it, you get a much better feel for how that molecule is put together. And so this is a situation where our students can actually um, build a glucose molecule and get a feel for that. Uh, we have them building uh, uh, fatty acid. We have them building a protein. Um, all these things are possible at that activity. Um, sort of over here, this tall green thing is a plant. Um, and we have a plant science exhibit. We put this in uh, not too long ago, about a year and a half ago. And what you're going to see here, we have several different things at that, at that activity for students. The one you're looking at here, though, is uh, the fertilization of plants. And it's kind of different from animals. And so instead of a bunch of sperm, they only have two sperm. And at the top there is a pollen grain, that reddish thing. And coming out of that's a pollen tube. A pollen grain is two cells, a tube cell. And inside of that, there's a generator cell that comes down. You'll see that cell's going to enter there and divide. So I click on this little sign at the bottom, it's kind of a, a blue sign there. And you'll see it starts to label things for you. You might want to zoom in on that. And you can always welcome to come back and look at it. So we label everything for the, for the students first. So they see the different parts of the, this is a, a carpal of a plant. And then you're going to see these labels will disappear and you will start getting the animation here. So the pollen tube, and you're going to see the generator cell comes in out of the pollen grain. And these are grown from the pollen grain. As the tube starts to grow down the style there. It divides into the two sperm. And so those sperm are going to move down the pollen tube, as you're seeing here. And it's going to come around, and it's going to come into the ovule. And uh, it's going to actually, the first sperm will fertilize that egg. The pink cell there is the egg cell. So now we have a zygote, a fertilized cell there. And the second sperm joins those two blue cells in the middle called the polar nuclei, and they form the endosperm, which becomes the food for the, for the growing uh, plant once the seed germinates. And so students can watch this. I mean, you can actually look at this in a textbook, but it's actually more fun I think for students to actually see this visually and be able to uh, understand how this takes place. So another thing we have there for students. Uh, some fun things for you guys. Uh, we have a biodiversity activity, one for plants and one for animals. So this pot here has a plant in it. Um, and uh, what is that plant? The students try to, we give them some information on that and they try to figure out what Phyla. We have there's ten phyla plants. We have all those ten phyla on the campus, and they can uh, go around. They find these different plants. So they're given the coordinates for those, um, so they can find them and they look at them and then they they click on that and actually you click below on those signs. You'll get a note card. It's going to give you some information about that. And this note card gives you four possibilities of what that plant could be and then they see if you can figure it out. That's kind of the idea there. Um, and so that's for plants. Over here, we have biodiversity for animals. That's what that A sign stands for. All these things are kind of labeled around the campus. So if you go there, you'll see a bunch of these signs. When I click on that, you'll see a Petri dish appear behind you. Um, and in that Petri dish, there's an animal that's going to start moving. And so your idea is to figure out what is that animal. Um, and again, uh, it's going to be one of the phyla that we have. And help, it's not a kitten. <laughs> And it's uh, moving slowly around that Petri dish. Um, and as it, uh, you get four, another four examples of which uh, to select from, which, uh, and you can try to figure out. Now, the students try to put this into a, uh, a tree, a phylogenetic tree, 
with, uh, and they label these so we um, they'll work out what the different phyla are, how they're uh, related to each other, both for the plants and the animals. And so you can see how that kind of works for students there. Um, got quite a bit of experience from teaching. We made a lot of mistakes. We've learned a lot from doing it, and we tried to capture all that in this uh, book you see here on the table. Uh, and if you click down below there, you'll get a uh, URL you can go to um, and get it, get this book. It's free. It's about 40 pages. It covers our experience in, in teaching in Second Life. Um, we've learned a lot from the mistakes that we've uh, actually made and uh, tried to correct those and things that worked and things that don't work. This book doesn't really give you that. It's not 40 pages there, but it does just give you the idea. In the, in the cover at the top of the book um, is the first page of the of the um, paper. It's this document. It's really a manual for teaching in virtual worlds is what the name of it is. And so you're welcome to go and get that and have a look at that. And, um, and again, uh, any questions on that or any of this other stuff, uh, visit the campus. There's a lot of other stuff there. Uh, Dave will be talking a little bit about the Grand Canyon. We have a Grand Canyon you can actually visit and walk down if you want to. Um, that was a lot of work to put that in, uh, and uh, it's uh, kind of a fun thing to do. We have the 11 different uh, strata there, and each strata is explained, and the fossils associated with those are explained. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much it for this display. Oh, wait, one more thing. Uh, we have some fun stuff. Well, two things. One we have behind over here next to the plant, there's a the Curiosity Martian rover. It just... Uh, found methane, pretty clearly found methane now on Mars, and it's in the news in the last week or two. And there's an example of that. Um, it's kind of fun to see. And then for folks who want to do something fun, and we have this on our campus too for students, um, this is a hoverboard. You can fly on this guy. Um, I'm not going to do that, but you can, we had a guy last night flying around in here. Uh, it was pretty fun. So um, afterwards, if you want to come back and uh, fly around, go ahead and you can shoot around this campus. This goes pretty fast. It's quite fun. Uh, just stand when you're done. It will go away. A new one appears at this site there. So Fantastic. I, need I to think that's it for me. Here, uh, because of our time limits. But thank you very much, Greg. What a fantastic uh, uh, booth you put together here. This is great. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we really do need to move along to keep with keep on schedule. Um, so uh, is Rob here? I believe uh, I have yes, Rob. Yes, I am uh, here. Our next uh, presenter. So back over the bridge again to the other side. I'm waving. All right. Here I am. Hello. Bit like herding cats here. Let's uh, let's all migrate over to uh, Rob across the bridge. Stand behind the booth here for no adequately explained reason. All right. Well, hello everybody. For some reason, I'm facing off to the left. I think it's just my stand animation. Um, but I will try and turn a little so I'm facing to the right. Whatever. Um, so my claim to fame it comes from 20 years ago. Between 1996 and for about 8 or 10 years, I was one of the core members of the Supernova Cosmology Project, which was Saul Perlmutter's team. And we were one of the two teams that discovered that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And Saul Perlmutter got the Nobel Prize in 2000. Was it 2011? I think for that. And a few years later, there was the Breakthrough Prize, which all the teams shared. So that was my claim to fame. Um, I have a lesser claim to fame that will be meaningful in this crowd and is not meaningful almost anywhere else. Um, I actually left academia for a couple of years, and from 2007 to 2009, I was Prospero Linden. I was a uh, operations engineer working for Linden Lab and Second Life. Around the same time, um, I started giving science talks in Second Life. I think the first couple I gave were 
associated with Troy McLuhan's um, Science Center, which occasionally I mix up Science Circle and Science Center because they start with C, and I have a one-character hashing algorithm in my brain. Um, and then I was with Micah while I was uh, at Linden Lab. I fell in with Micah, George Drogowski, and Pete Hutt. We were trying to make an astronomy department in Second Life, and we actually had some people come in and give professional seminars. I gave a lot of public outreach talks. I gave them very frequently back then. And nowadays I give talks with Science Circle, and I do a few a year, uh, depending on... I mean, I've, I've gone some years where I'm only showing up once or twice. Uh, it depends how good... Uh, Chantal and Jess are at corralling me, really is what it comes down to. So what I've got in front of me here are small versions of some of the things I've made for some of the talks that I've given. I've, they're usually bigger when I pull them out during my talks. But um, over on your right side or my left side here, uh, this first thing actually is one of the older things that I made. It was, um, this is supposed to be the progenitor of a Type 1A supernova. Oops, I walked through the back of my thing. It's all phantom, so I can walk through it. Um, this is a red giant star, and then pulling off of the red giant star is some of the gas into an accretion disk around a white dwarf, which is the little glowing thing at the middle of the disk. Eventually, the white dwarf builds up enough mass that it explodes as a supernova, and that's pretty exciting. Just to the right of that, I have a pulsar. It's a neutron star that's rotating, has some hot spots. When the hot spots point at you, you see a pulsation. The next one is a little cutaway star. It's not highly detailed. It has an envelope and a nucleus. Yay, not very exciting. Um, but I actually have a few little features on it. I can turn on these arrows. Let's see if it actually listens to me. It doesn't seem to be listening to me. Oh, I can turn on arrows, but I failed to rescale the particles. Um, so that was a little uh, overwhelming. Uh, I, have, I, <laughs> I didn't rescale everything right. So, um, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, it, to demonstrate the conflict between gravity and pressure inside the star. And so now I should have turned it all back off again. Yeah, everyone's just died. Of, well, it was pressure. Um, and I think I've turned it off, but it seems to still be going. So um, please stop. Pressure off. There we go. I think it stopped. Good. Um, next, this is one. these next two on the right are more recent things. And these are actually mesh objects, which I started playing around with in the last few years, as did lots of people. Well, actually, most people started before I did. But um, this funnel-looking thing you probably recognize as being a visualization of a black hole, and actually it's mathematically correct, it turns out. I built it in Blender, and I uh, put the things in the right place so that it's a real embedding diagram of a black hole. And then the next thing over here is for the most recent black hole talk I gave. This is a, a black hole with an accretion disk and two jets coming out of it. That's a structure that you see at the core of active galactic nuclei, which is kind of a cool thing there, too. Yeah, it was actually M87 was the one that we gave a talk about. And I once won a nickel because I uh, correctly identified a Messier galaxy. A guy was giving a talk. And he put up a picture of M81, and he said it was M87. And I said, oh, that's actually M81. And he was pretty sure, and I was pretty sure, and it didn't really matter. It was just a name. And I said, I'll bet you a nickel. He said, okay. And he went on with his talk. Well, a week later, this is Ethan Siegel. He's actually a, um, a blogger that you can find on Forbes, a very good uh, cosmology blogger. And I got a check for five cents from him because he looked it up. And, in fact, the galaxy was M81. So I still have that check for five cents. Epic scientific bets, you know. So anyway, that's what these things are. If above me, I've got two things rotating. The one right above you right now is a binary star, which I pulled out when I was giving a talk about finding extrasolar planets. Um, on the other side, there is a planet orbiting a star, and you can see the wobble reflex motion of the star, which is one of the things that we look for when we're trying to find extrasolar planets. Um, so all of these things, actually some of these I made way back in the day in uh, 10 or 12 years ago. I sort of had an astronomy gallery in Second Life. When I was working at Linden Lab, I was paid better than I'm paid now. And uh, I actually had, I didn't never had my own region, but I did have a lot of mainland, and I had a little astronomy museum that some of these things were in. But some of these others were things that I made for talks. Um, all of these objects should be set to be copyable, so if you want one, just right-click on it and select Take a Copy. And you'll have your very own uh, active galactic nucleus core if you want. And then I've got three boxes over here, which are um, 
T-shirts, one for mesh avatars, one for classic avatars, and then a box of planets. The planets are the same planets that uh, behind me, depending on what your draw distance is, you can probably see a big brick dome and um, way back behind me with a bunch of planets in front of me. And those are, that's my planetarium, which I, a year or two ago, I gave a tour of that planetarium. Um, I think that was in a December for the, for the science circle. You can go in there and play around with it. It's not the easiest thing in the world to use, but there are some buttons in there. You can try and set your latitude and longitude and time, and you can see what stars would be up and what planets would be up there, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, if you want your own version of those planets, go ahead and uh, go ahead and click on the box over there and get that. And yes, I'm sorry, I don't have any dino shirts. I just have astronomy t-shirts. Um, but yes, don't say Beetlejuice three times. Um, I guess if you say it backwards, it summons Rumble Stillskin or something. I'm not actually sure how that works. Uh, anyway, so I will uh, I will stop there um, unless anybody has any questions that they want to ask me. You no, know, the next thing I am scheduled to do is together with Sizigi and I forgot who the other person was, is a panel about the most exciting things in our fields. Plans for the future. Well, you know what? My plans for the future are complicated. My life has been a little complicated. I was supposed to go to Vanderbilt and get tenure and stay there forever, and I had a little trouble getting funding. That's why I went to Linden Lab for a couple years. Well, I have now been at two different small liberal arts colleges. The first one was in Canada, and for family reasons, I had to come back to the U.S. And I am now at Westminster College, and they, like a lot of small liberal arts colleges in the U.S., are having financial problems. And they are going to reduce the size of the physics department from three to two. I am the most recent arrival, so after next year, I'm going to be out. So I'm going to be looking for another job this year. So I have no idea what's going to happen. I may end up being out of academia. Uh, I will find out. As for talks I'm going to give, all I know is the, uh, the panel, and I probably will give two or three talks next year um, in Science Circle and just watch the Science Circle calendar to see when all the talks are. Yeah, I think this is our... Um... Oops. Hello, hello, testing, testing. We hear you. Oh, you do? Okay, I can't see. Oh, there we go. I wasn't, I think it's just lag. I couldn't see my sound waves. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think, uh, Chantal, you can confirm this, but I believe this is our uh, final um, event for this academic year with the Science Circle. Um, we'll be on summer hiatus. Uh, but we will be resuming our presentations and panel discussions uh, in the fall. And forgive me, I'm having a little bit of lag. Um, uh, I just heard an, uh, uh, um a video start playing and I think that's um, Steven's uh, uh, booth over there uh, Kip so um, why don't we work our way over to uh, Kip's booth so Steven can tell us a little bit about um, his work with educational media in Second Life and in podcasting Thank you, Rob. It's always a pleasure to uh, listen to you present. Great, thanks. Even on the other side of the bridge? Uh, yes, I think he's across the bridge. Uh, he was near the piano. He's actually near the piano uh, where Ari was playing. Just a quick check, make sure my audio is working. Looks like it's okay. You go ahead and poke me when you're ready there, uh, Baragon. Uh, yep, thank you. Uh, take it away. I'm having a, <coughs> a lag attack here. We've, uh, we've got a nice crowd here today, so I'm 
moving through molasses, but uh, don't wait for me. Go ahead and get started. <laughs> okay, I appreciate it. Well, I am Steve Van Hook. I'm Kip Rappo. Kip Rappo, I don't get to say that name much anymore. Uh, I will keep it brief. Uh, Baragon Betts is a master timekeeper. I'm not going to put him to the test. I know this is no easy uh, task, keeping us all on track, and you do it so well. Baragon, if you haven't been thanked numerous times by now, let me add my name to the list. Uh, what we got here are some samples of educational communication resources. This is what I offer in my online and on-ground classes. Uh, and on my parcels here on uh, the Science Circle Sim, just a few steps from here. You can see it there in the background. Uh, I started that build uh, about the first of the year. Uh, I've been working on educational builds for about 12 years here in Second Life. In fact, I just double-checked that June 24th. Was my res day just a couple of days ago, exactly 20, uh, 12 years ago, if my math is right. We got as a system, and you can double. I've uh, done some larger builds, uh, one time an entire island uh, spinning way, way, way too many hours. You know how that goes. And this time around, I am making it much more practical uh, than playful, though I love all your toys. I don't have any toys here. You got such great toys uh, you've been showing off. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, I have been squeezing in uh, what work when I can and minimizing any of the fun this time around. You know how easily that all gets away next time. You spent two hours making sure your turtle has enough swimming room. Um, so let me just quickly, let me run through just some of the stuff that I've got here, and you can click whatever might grab your attention. Uh, I'm still very much a working educator. There's my institutions there behind me. I teach for... Four different universities. I'm one of those road-running adjunct professors of communications at uh, UCLA, UCSB, California Lutheran National University, and a few others. I've done that about 20 years now after returning from overseas work in media and public education programs. So I do lots of multitasking. I've been multitasking this morning, listening to your great presentations in the background. Uh, and uh, also work evenings and weekends and uh, on uh, Saturdays and Sundays I often do uh, captain and chaplain work. I live here at, on a harbor. Uh, I have been uh, working since 2000, the year 2000, to push my departments at these universities to expand their use of technological tools for learners. That's what my doctorate in is in transcultural distance learning. And they've been very receptive uh, to a lot of what I've done. Um, I have uh, also been showing uh, Second Life uh, possibilities off to department heads. Uh, and as you know, uh, they can be a little reluctant sometimes to pick it up. Ironically, uh, UCSB and UCLA, where I teach, were ground zero of the Internet. The first email sent over the Internet between UCSB, UCLA, Stanford University, and I think it was the University of Utah. I always forget what the fourth one was, but here they are seriously lagging behind, and they admit it. You know, academia moves uh, very glacially uh, sometimes. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, at a recent meeting at uh, UCLA with their Global Futures program, it's a in, in institution program. They were very excited about it. And we were going to set up uh, some trial uh, exhibits, a seminar, something like that. Unfortunately, then the program imploded, uh, and it's beginning to settle now. They got a new dean coming in, so I think uh, UCLA is actually uh, going to take some interest in this. It may take a while. I tend to think in terms of months and years rather than hours and days, like I did in the media. Mostly, what they're interested in is the sense of place. They love that idea for gatherings and, and lectures and seminars where people can come in and sit with each other, look at each other, and if they're going to be attending a live seminar any anyway on one of the other platforms, why not do it in a virtual world where there's more interactivity and, and some uh, play going on now and then, uh, educational play, of course. So that's where I'm keeping my focus as I'm trying to bring these institutions in is very much a practical use 
of some of these materials. So that's what we see here is very practical, uh, educational uh, sorts of materials. Uh, I also uh, uh, design open source courses for Sailor Academy. So at one point, I actually had one of their full courses happening in World, and that worked very well. So I'm working on a number of fronts, trying to bring educational uh, institutions into this, expand uh, the outreach. Some of the resources you see here, I am a researcher in uh, Transcultural teaching and multi -class, uh, multicultural classrooms. So you've got some of my research and writings here, including an article published not long ago by the United Nations, UNESCO, and a recent article on developments in education technology that was published in the Journal of Distance Learning Administration. That's pretty much where my focus is now. How are we going to how are we going to expand these learning resources, <clears throat> especially to uh, precluded people. Uh, so the Science Circle podcast, uh, uh, when Science Circle mentioned they were looking for a podcast, I said that might be a good time to reach out in this area. I've been doing this about six months now. Uh, there's about some 15 different episodes hosted on about a dozen different platforms. Uh, you see the signs here. You click on any one sign that looks interesting to you. It might take you where you want to go, including our uh, list of topics. And, and they have been excellent, and that is no doubt one of the reasons every single platform that's been submitted to has picked this up, including some of the big guys. If you click uh, that platform link, it's got direct links embedded that will take you directly uh, to the Science Circle uh, podcast. Uh, on uh, the bill that I've got over here, there's lots of videos and materials for uh, communication students. There's a learning lab for English. Uh, as well as featured presentations by Science Circle scientists and educators. I've got two signs here uh, right in front of me. You click the black one, that's going to give you some links to in-world uh, videos. You can take a look at those from some of our very best Science Circle presenters. And if you click the white sign, that'll give you some uh, landmarks to learning resources uh, that we've got here in the build. Uh, the globe does nothing. Um, but I've just always loved globes and kaleidoscopes, so that's one my one toy here. Uh, for the future, uh, yes, it does spin. Is it spinning the right direction? It, it is spinning the right direction. I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson once pointed out that the world spinning on the Daily Show is spinning in the wrong direction. <laughs> Watch for that. I wonder if they fixed that or if they're even still using it. Anyway, for the future... Uh, definitely looking for expanded interactivity and social experience for learners, trying to minimize that overhead. That is the number one complaint I hear from my institutions. Too much overhead, too many system demands, uh, and too much of a learning curve. The students aren't going to do it. The instructors aren't going to do it. So the simpler everything gets, the easier it's going to be to try to bring them in on it. Um, I'm looking to uh, put in a few sample areas for these different universities I teach for. Basically, just uh, a few uh, lecture videos that I use in the classes that I teach for them, maybe a promo uh, video, whatever the universities put out. Just something that they can come and take a look and possibly a sample lecture uh, so they can see how that would fit together and invite some students in. And that's pretty much what I got here. Feel free to click, take whatever you want, uh, a link to whatever you want. These are all open source videos, learning materials. Use them as however they might uh, serve you. And uh, just thank you for stopping by. Thank you, Jess and Chan, for all your good work putting this together. Baragon Betts for your excellent timing. Uh, just that you're here today, <laughs> this group that uh, says you are on the cutting edge of education. You are the heroes of reform, the avatars of the future. And I thank you all for that. And I uh, come Right on. Through. Thank you so much, Stephen. A uh, really nice booth. I really love all the materials you've uh, provided here. Um, so, a uh, little change of plan. Uh, it turns out that uh, DP uh, was able to uh, attend today, and she has a booth. So, um, before we finish up with Day Miami at the end, um, I want to squeeze uh, DP in to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, her materials. Um, she uh, prefers to speak and uh, to present in text. 
So I will read her text in voice for purposes of any recording that we have going on here. Um, so uh, let's see if we can... Here she is. Uh, over here by the bridge and the lion statue behind the hot dog stand over here. And uh, thank you, DP. Really glad you could make it uh, today. DP, you can go ahead and uh, just type in nearby chat, and then uh, I'll just uh, read it in voice. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm DP, and I write science articles for the Science Circle. By the way, these articles are posted at the Science Circle website, so um, uh, don't forget about the Science Circle website. It's a great resource. New articles are posted on the 1st and 15th of each month, and here is uh, a link to find them. Articles to date are June 15th, Islands in Our Minds, June 1st, Science and Philosophy, May 15th, The Fascination of Science, May 1st, A New Beginning. Those sound like good topics. And my next column uh, publishes on July 1st, and it features an interview with Vic. I am always looking for people to interview for my next column. Some upcoming column ideas are below. If you have expertise in any of these areas or have an interesting research program, contact me and we'll arrange an interview. How do astronomers make pictures from radio signals? For example, the recent picture of a black hole black swan events? Does anyone know of a recent event that's really compelling? And can anyone explain in simple terms how prime numbers are used in PGP? What is PGP? The privacy actually <laughs> is the name of it. It's a 
Oh, it's the password. Ah, yeah, very good. That's cool. Yeah, okay. the, the, the algorithms that use are the same algorithms that are used to um, encrypt everything um, that goes through secure channels on the web. Fantastic. So those are uh, those are all really good topics. I look forward to the articles. Uh, anything else, uh, DP? Before we move along, I want to. Uh, well, I guess we still have a little time, actually. Uh, DP is the uh, is sort of the title of your um, uh, uh, I guess a blog or or platform uh, hypothesis. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks uh, very much, DP. This is a great resource to uh, to know about. Um, I'm really glad we could bring it to the attention of our students. Um, we do have one uh, final presenter today, uh, Day Miami, um, who I think is going to say a few words about the Grand Canyon build. So why don't we find uh, Day, and he'll be our final presenter. Okay, I'm here. All right, I hear you. I think you. I'm across the bridge, am I not? I'm next to, to Greg's booth. Okay. We'll find you. Oh, wait a minute. No, hold it. I'm mistaken. Here's Greg's <laughs> booth, so we're over here. I'm all messed up. I've walked around so much. Man, we have a really good uh, crowd here today. We've got uh, 26 people here. That's good. Uh, thanks again, DP. That was really nice. I'm glad you could uh, make it today. I didn't realize I was going to be last, but in a way, this works out well. Um, and I'm a little embarrassed because some of you did such an amazing job. I've been up in New York visiting relatives all over the last, about for the last week, so I haven't had as much time to put into this as I'd like. Chantel told me about the Science Circle, uh, Science Fair. I thought it was a really cool idea and encouraged me to talk about uh, the Grand Canyon. And you've already heard Greg speak a little bit to you about uh, the the Grand Canyon Sim on Second Life and the amazing job that Nova's done. In fact, if you look at the booth, I did go to the Grand Canyon Sim and I took a picture uh, inside the booth on the far right-hand side. You can fly around. That's sort of a fun thing to do because it's hard to do in the Grand Canyon itself. And one of the things that Greg didn't say that I thought was amazing was as you fly around, there are little and you click on them and you get a note card about each layer in the canyon, which I think is very informative and, and helpful for students. Plus, there's a platform at the very bottom of the, uh, of the canyon, which has got a, a series of diagrams and so on. Yeah, right, Baragon. I've, I've led several field trips now. I did one, I think, for VISTI and ISTI and maybe the Science Circle and talked about the geology of the Grand Canyon. So um, after we did that one last summer, what happened was I was talking with Vic Santucci, Ventucci, who's the senior paleontologist at the Grand Canyon. At the time, I just wanted to do a sim on Eagle Rock here in Virginia. And Vince goes, yeah, it's a really cool sim, the, the Eagle Rock one. Why don't you do one for the Grand Canyon? And I thought he was joking, and he wasn't. And he said, oh, no, we, 
we're here at the National Park Service. We would love to have you do a Grand Canyon simulation, and we would sync it in with our 100th centennial celebration uh, that we're going to be doing with the National Park Service this year. Uh, it's actually going to be coming up um, in, I believe it's September, October, and I'm invited to go out to Arizona uh, to be part of that. I'm not sure if I can because it also is right in the middle when I'm teaching, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to work that out. So uh, I said absolutely, and I created uh, a couple of versions of the Grand Canyon simulation. By the way, word got out, oh my gosh, it was you talk about online collaboration. Within a day, I was getting code from Germany. I was getting uh, texturing software from Australia. Um, it was that sort of collaboration that made it real easy for me to knock this project out. And, and I had a prototype to send to the National Park Service within two days uh, that they thought was amazing, and then we refined it. Um, so there's a version, there's a multiplayer version on by Wooly, and I'll type in the for those of you that have an account on that, it's .org, or it might be .com, uh, but they are mainly for K-12 education, so um, you'd have to get permission to go on there. Um, and then after that, what I did was a virtual reality one for the Oculus Rift, um, and I've demonstrated that at uh, the VISTI conference. Um, in Virginia Beach last year, I presented it for the Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy uh, last spring. Had some state geologists on there. I've got some pictures of it somewhere. Um, but one of the things that I realized was that not everybody has a gaming rig and an Oculus Rift. So what I did was I put together a version, scaled it down by about a factor of 10, and created a simpler version that will run on cheaper school computers and that's available on oops, this website if you go there um, I don't know why it's not coming up as a URL if you go there right on the home page at the bottom right it'll say click here to oh it's a comma that's what it is I'm in trouble there we go now we have a URL if you go to that uh, website in the lower right hand corner, you'll see a link uh, on my website to download um, both the software uh, that I developed for the National Park Service. Also, there are student activities that you can do. I've done them at the college level. They work at K-12 as well. They're not really complicated, but you basically make a geologic map after you've done this tour. Um, one thing that you're going to see when you go to that website at the very top is they'll say, this is an insecure website. Uh, please don't believe that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, very good. Please do not believe the comment about this being insecure. I have talked to GoDaddy, who is my main hosting thing, um, and what they've told me is that um, unless you pay 80 bucks for an SSL, um, Google is going to put that message up there. To me, it's technological blackmail. All right. Um, and what they are worried about is websites like Amazon or Target that have been hacked, all right, where people have gone on there and they've got secure information. Uh, and I have told Google, GoDaddy, and I've told Google, there is nothing on my website. There's no account information. I don't collect information on clients. I don't have account names on there, I don't have passwords on there, I certainly don't have credit card information on there. There is nothing, uh, there is nothing insecure about that. Oh, really, Rob? GoDaddy wanted to charge me somewhere around 60 to 80 bucks. All right, we have to talk later about that, okay, if you know a way to get around that. Um, and I said, no, I'm not doing it. So, anyway, um, Go ahead and, and click away. Um, I've run that software. Oh, thanks for the URL. I'll check that out later. Um, and um, okay, so those are the uh, the websites. Like I said, you see a box on the table. It says click here to get an LM and URLs for the Grand Canyon. Um, to the right of me here is Penny, and. Um, we t I talked with her when we were setting up the booth, I think it was last week, and she was telling me about a really cool 
a thing called Dreamscapes that is opened in LA. And what it is is an exhibit. And you go in there, it's totally VR. But um, it's, from what I heard, they've really done a nice job on it. You put the headset on, and you have a choice of going through a, there's like a virtual alien zoo. Or there's, what else? Uh, there's an ocean simulation you go into. There's, I believe, an historical simulation as well on there. Um, all the information is, uh, all the information is on there. And um, uh, in that card, the net card that you can grab. And say a little bit about, since I'm at the end of not only this science fair project, but also um, also for the, um, you know, for the session that we're going to be doing, uh, what I've been working on this summer is researching the mass extinctions. And I sort of gave a hint at my last presentation on this, um, that I'd be talking about the late Ordovician mass extinction. I've been out in the field. I've been sharing some pictures with Chantel a couple of weeks ago, and... Uh, coming this fall, I'm going to present my research on the late Ordovician. And interestingly enough, it's not just a research topic for research and universities. Um, this is filtering down to the K-12 in my high school. Now I'm required to talk about mass extinctions and fossils and fossil evidence. Work. So that is coming up in the fall. And we are just a few minutes past one o'clock. Uh, does anybody have any questions? If not, I wish you all a good afternoon. Thanks to you. Yay, applause. Uh. Okay, um, and with that, I will bring our science fair presentations to a close. I'm going to declare this a tremendous success. I hope we can do it again next year. Um, thank you to all the uh, booth providers and content providers. Uh, you guys all did great. Uh, and uh, thanks to Chantal and Jess for organizing all of this. Um, you all have a great summer, and we'll see you again in the fall with another slate of presentations and panel discussions. Also, of course, these booths will remain up, so feel free to uh, come by and uh, explore them in more detail at your leisure. <laughs>